Murders, disappearances, and unidentifieds are far from unique to the 20th and 21st centuries. Presumably, there were magi tracking killers and thieves across the deserts of Egypt, and Shire Reefs puzzling over medieval John and Jane Doe's on the moors and downs of England. Centuries later, their methods and tools must have seemed hopelessly antiquated to the new enlightened minds embracing science and logic. Even today, it is all too easy to look back over the last 200 or even 35 years and simultaneously marvel at the incredible advances and ponder how it is that so many mysteries continue to endure. This feature will focus on two separate and seemingly unique Jane Doe's. Save for the fact that they both hail from the state of Kentucky, they appear on the surface to have little in common. One likely came from the upper rungs of society's ladder, the other near the ground. One apparently died in full view of many people, the other likely met her end in the sole company of her killer. Most striking of all, one departed this world sometime in the 1840s, the other in 1988. However, today, these Jane Doe's share the one common denominator which has thus far secured their continued notoriety. They remain unidentified. Harrodsburg, Kentucky is located at the geographical center of the Bluegrass State. It holds the historical distinction of being the first permanent settlement west of the Appalachian Mountains, having been founded in 1774, two years before America's independence. For the first few decades of its existence, it was a frontier town in every sense of the word finding itself pitted against not only the redcoats, but the native population as well. By the early 1800s, the immediate threat from human foes had mostly passed, and the town began growing and expanding like many other outposts in what was then the West. To paraphrase an old commercial, the West was Harrodsburg, Kentucky, 200 years ago, then it started moving westward with a long, long way to go. Today, Harrodsburg is pardonably proud of its lengthy history and heritage. Many relics from its past 246 years are proudly displayed in the form of old buildings, monuments, and historical markers, each reading its own chapter from Harrodsburg's extensive novel. Most of these historical points of interest are common of such towns. A recreated 18th century fort, lovingly restored antebellum homes, even an olive drab panzer standing guard along the town's northern approach. However, one of Harrodsburg's historical curiosities is not quite so ubiquitous. Roughly a hundred feet south of this 19th century pump house stands a small whitewashed enclosure. Within its picket fence boundaries rests a seemingly bland looking slab of weathered concrete. However, looks, as we know, can be deceiving. According to local lore, this humble monument marks the final resting place of a woman who could very well be the oldest documented Jane Doe in North America. Her story is a fascinating combination of history, myth, fact, and guesswork. 
a story that both legends and crime novels are made of, a story whose genesis can be traced to the early 1800s and a man known affectionately as Dr. Graham. Born in Mercer County, Kentucky, on October 10, 1787, Christopher Columbus Graham was the epitome of the Southern scholar. After serving in the War of 1812, he attended Transylvania University in Lexington, eventually becoming the first graduate of medicine west of the Appalachian Mountains. During his life, he rubbed shoulders with such eminent figures as Daniel Boone and George Rogers Clark. He was said to have been a master marksman, dubbed by some the William Tell of Kentucky. In 1819, Dr. Graham came to Harrodsburg. Not long thereafter, he married Teresa Sutton. In the mid-1820s, Teresa's father, David Sutton, acquired the Greenville Springs, known throughout the region for its healing waters and bucolic setting. In June of 1827, Christopher Graham purchased the 287 acres upon which the Sutton Springs were located. He did not dawdle and immediately set about improving the grounds and amenities, adding new cottages during his first year as proprietor. Board was $5 for one week, $2 extra for care and feeding of one's horse. During the next 25 years, Christopher Graham proceeded to enlarge and refine the springs, adding and refining them a little more each season. Newspaper accounts from around the blossoming United States frequently touted the lavish amenities being offered by Dr. Graham. Eventually, Graham's Harrodsburg Springs earned the lavish moniker, the Saratoga of the West. Although its heyday ended 170 years ago, the lavishness of Dr. Graham's resort was well documented. Advertisements for upcoming seasons, along with the 19th century equivalent of reviews from numerous publications, have provided historians with an almost year-by-year -year account of the spring's existence. Announcements about additional services, new buildings, and gala events were widely circulated via the agate type. According to modern accounts, it was amidst this fairy tale like atmosphere that the legend of the Harrodsburg Jane Doe was born. Although details have become lost and jumbled over the years, the essence of her captivating story goes something like this. Sometime in the 1840s, a man and woman, whose names have been lost to time, came to stay at the Harrodsburg Springs. They each appeared to be the very image of Southern aristocracy. She was reported to have been strikingly beautiful. He was said to have been well-dressed and proper with a genial personality. In some accounts, they arrived at the Springs in a private carriage accompanied by several servants. They signed in under names, which later proved to be false. The couple were not inconspicuous, and the lovely Belle, in particular, had a fondness for dancing. Each night, the guests would gather in the ballroom, where they were entertained by talented musicians, with Dr. Graham himself serving as MC. Here... The bells and their bows swayed, twirled, and mingled amidst what was described as, quote, a sea of glittering lights and interesting company. During one of these evening affairs, the beautiful woman appeared to be livelier than ever, by some accounts dancing every single set with seemingly endless energy. At some point during the night's revelry, the lady is said to have suddenly fallen to the floor. According to some, she died where she fell. By other accounts, she lingered for another day or two before passing away. Amidst the confusion, her male companion, along with their servants, fled the springs. It was the height of summer, and the only means of travel at the time was by horse and buggy. 
Knowing that her remains would soon begin to decompose in the heat, Dr. Graham had the lady buried amidst the trees and walkways to the south of the hotel and cottages. Some say the young lady had previously relayed to Dr. Graham that if she were to suddenly pass on, she would like to be buried in a particular location she frequented. A check of the town given as the couple's home revealed no one with their names having lived there. By some accounts, Dr. Graham knew the woman's true identity, but for whatever reason kept it a secret for the remainder of his years. The event, although tragic, eventually faded from memory, and life at the Springs went on as usual for another decade. In 1853, Dr. Graham sold the Harrodsburg Springs to the United States government. For four years, it served as the Western Military Asylum, a convalescent home for elderly soldiers. In 1857, the asylum moved to Washington, D.C. The opulent land and buildings were left vacant and exposed to the elements. During the Civil War, the ballroom was used as a hospital for soldiers injured during the Battle of Perryville. Gradually, fire and the regular passage of time claimed the many structures which had once catered to the society set. The U.S. government was unable to sell the property until 1887. By then, nearly all traces of the original Harrodsburg Springs had passed into memory. According to newspaper accounts, the last of the original structures, known as Morgan's Row, were claimed by fire in 1894. Not long thereafter, another grand structure was erected on what had been the western edge of the Springs property. In 1911, the owners opened the home to the public and rechristened it Old Graham Springs. For another 30 years, the second incarnation of the Harrodsburg Springs thrived. After the Second World War, the large brick structure was torn down, and what is now the Ephraim McDowell James B. Hagen Hospital was constructed. Today, very little remains of the original Harrodsburg Springs. The land where the original buildings once stood was gradually divided up into individual tracts of land and is today a large slice of suburbia. Here, along Moreland Avenue, a small stretch of stone wall which once marked the spring's northern boundary still stands. A discernible notch between two of the original sections delineates the spot where the main gate leading onto the grounds once stood. The southwestern corner of the Old Springs property is today occupied by Young's Community Park. Here, this 19th century pump house, the main source of water for the original springs, still stands and has been converted into a small shaded resting place. Nearby, a state-erected memorial marker informs those passing by that they are trotting the grounds of the former Harrodsburg Springs. And here, another 200 feet or so to the south, is the reported final resting place of the Harrodsburg Jane Doe. As one might expect from a story that has now spanned 180 years, the veracity of the tale surrounding the Harrodsburg Jane Doe has naturally been called into question. Some feel it is little more than pure fantasy, a 19th century folktale spun to help preserve the history of antebellum Kentucky. Others feel the story may hold some water, but has likely been twisted and embellished over the years. And there are those who take the legend largely as gospel and have gone to great lengths to try and unravel the mangled yarn. Is the Harrodsburg Jane Doe real or just a legend? If the proof of the pudding is in the eating, then the portions are frustratingly small. The normal sources of corroborating evidence, contemporary accounts, and documentation are non-existent. 
The Commonwealth of Kentucky did not start keeping birth and death records until 1853, and no contemporary newspaper accounts about such an incident have been located. Ephemera from the Harrodsburg Springs, such as the desk register and guest lists, if they were even kept, have long since vanished. Most accounts place the date of the woman's death at some point during the 1840s. Photography was in its infancy, and the daguerreotype had been slower to catch on in America as opposed to Europe. Indeed, the only known image of the Harrodsburg Springs is this pen and ink drawing dating to sometime in the late 1840s or early 1850s. From 1857 until 1887, the only articles referencing the former Harrodsburg Springs were those which documented the repeated attempts by the U.S. government to sell the property. In the early articles, as well as the congressional record, the land and buildings were described in some detail, but no mention was made of a burial or burials having been made anywhere on the 200-acre spread. This map, from 1876, shows the property boundaries, owners' names, and building locations. Here, the location of the gateway leading onto the spring's grounds is clearly visible and even labeled. The location of the Jane Doe's grave is today located here, just south of the Mineral Spring, which is almost certainly the site of the surviving pump house. Nowhere is there any indication of a grave or burial grounds in the area. By 1895, interest in local history had risen. On September 1st of that year, the Louisville Courier-Journal published this extensive article on the Harrodsburg and Blue Lick Springs. For over two full columns, the history and even the physical layout of the former springs are described through both contemporary writings and reminiscences. Even though the overall tone of the article is flowery and romantic, there is no mention of either the unknown woman or her grave. In fact, the oldest reference to the unknown grave we were able to find is an extensive essay by historian Martha Stevenson, which appeared in the register of the Kentucky State Historical Society in January of 1914. This highly detailed account states that at one time there was a little graveyard containing six mounds on the grounds of the springs. By 1914, the location of the graveyard was said to have been obliterated from the landscape, leaving only the stone at the site of the lone grave. The essay dismisses the idea of the unknown woman having died or fainted while dancing as pure romance. It does, however, seem to accept as fact that a young woman did die while staying at the springs and was buried on the grounds at a location she had fancied. Later that year, the Lexington Herald Sun published a short article and poem about the lone grave. Curiously, it describes the grave as being unmarked, whereas the Stevenson essay and this article from 1926 each make reference to a flat stone which had at one time been supported on pillars which had since fallen. In 1935, two possible identities for the unknown woman emerged within a month of one another. On February 3rd of that year, the Lexington Herald Sun ran this article in which 73-year-old Lexington resident James Roop asserted that the unknown woman was Molly Sewell, the second wife of Taswell, Tennessee resident Joe Sewell. According to Roop, in approximately 1872, he was told by Sewell that Molly had, quote, danced herself to death at Harrodsburg, end quote, many years earlier. Sewell, who would have been about 40 years old in 1872, said that he and Molly had been estranged at the time and that she visited the springs on her own accord. 
However, just over a month later, on March 8th, the Kentucky Advocate threw cold water on Roop's assertion. According to their sources, two separate incidents which had occurred at the Springs had become fused over the decades. The article stated that the legends of a woman dying while dancing at the Springs were true, but had become greatly exaggerated over the years. The unknown woman was buried on the grounds of the Springs, but her grave had never been marked, and her identity was still a mystery. The article went on to say that the stone marker had been placed over the grave of Mississippi resident Minnie Reeser, a sister-in-law of the governor of Mississippi. Reeser was reportedly in ill health and visited the springs for medicinal purposes. She is said to have enjoyed walking the grounds and had a favorite resting place along one of the many walkways. Knowing her health was failing, she requested to be buried at this location should she succumb. Reeser did pass away while at the springs, and her request, although somewhat sentimental, was honored. The article went on to state that around 1875, a man named Dr. M. L. Forsyth, a former resident of Harrodsburg, returned to the town from his home in Mississippi. He was accompanied by a woman listed only as a Mrs. All, wife of Dr. C. D. Tucker, who had known Minnie Reeser as well as other members of the Reeser family. Mrs. All is reported to have related the true facts of the incident to noted Harrodsburg historian Mariah Thompson Davies, who subsequently published them in the local paper. In closing, the article states that 86-year-old Harrodsburg resident Archie Scantlin remembered the stone placed over Minnie Reeser's grave before its inscription had been defaced. Scanlon, who died shortly before the article's publication, is said to have given a copy of the original inscription to the president of the Harrodsburg Historical Society, Dr. Condent Van Ardstel. The inscription was said to have then been housed in the Society's archives. The 1914 essay by Martha Thompson and the 1935 article in the Kentucky Advocate raise an intriguing question. Is it possible that more than one unknown woman lay buried beneath the former grounds of the Harrodsburg Springs? If she did, in fact, exist, could the lady, who, according to legend, danced herself to death, be merely one of several unfortunate souls whose names have been lost to time and whose mortal remains lay buried in Young's Park? They will probably never know the answer to these questions unless the ground beneath this concrete memorial is excavated. Recent efforts by Todd Matthews, the founder of the Doe Network, to have the remains exhumed for DNA extraction have been rebuffed by local authorities. Just who was the unknown Southern Belle who reportedly breathed her last at the Harrodsburg Springs? What little we know about the Harrodsburg Jane Doe is based mostly on rumor and second-hand non-contemporary accounts. She is said to have come to the Harrodsburg Spring sometime in the 1840s, perhaps registering under the name of Virginia Stafford. She is usually reported to have been in her early 20s and may have been accompanied by an unidentified male and several servants. Some later stated that the woman hailed from one of the so-called cotton states of the Deep South or perhaps New Orleans. It was later speculated that she may have been either Molly Black Sewell or Minnie Reeser, both of whom originally hailed from Mississippi. If the legend is accurate, then the Harrodsburg Jane Doe was laid to rest on what would have been the southwestern corner of the old Harrodsburg Springs property. Her gravestone may at one time have been inscribed in some way, although by 1914, any words, letters, or numbers had been eroded. Today, the legend of the Harrodsburg Jane Doe continues, as do the faintest hopes 
that advances in technology, or perhaps a deep dive research effort, will one day shed light on the identity of the radiantly beautiful woman who supposedly danced herself to death. Although aged, the Harrodsburg Jane Doe is not alone in her anonymity. A hundred and forty years later, and over sixty miles away, the remains of another unfortunate woman were discovered in rural Owen County. To this day, her identity, too, remains a mystery. However, unlike her nineteenth-century predecessor, the circumstances of her death were far less romantic. Owen County, Kentucky, population 11,000, is located just over 35 miles north of Lexington. Named after Colonel Abraham Owen, it is a mostly rural and mountainous locale. It offers up an abundance of natural beauty with its rolling hills and numerous lakes and streams. It is an ideal spot for those seeking to hunt, fish, or escape the big city life of Cincinnati, some 55 miles to the north. Hardly the type of place where one would expect to come across an unsolved homicide or Jane Doe. And yet, for the last 34 years, that is exactly what residents of Owen County have been faced with. A brutal murder in which the identity of both the killer and victim have remained shrouded in mystery. An enigmatic and baffling set of circumstances which continue to confound local residents as well as law enforcement. All this stemming from one gruesome discovery on the morning of Friday, May 6, 1988. It is a day that Owen County resident Joy Kelly has said she will never forget. That morning, Kelly and her husband set out from their home along Kentucky Route 330. Their sole intention that morning was mundane, to get their newspaper. What they found, however, was far from mundane. Up a small grassy embankment, Kelly and her husband came across what they at first thought was an animal carcass from one of the many farms in the area. The truth was far more sinister. Upon closer inspection, they saw that what they had stumbled upon was not an animal, but a person. The authorities were contacted, and representatives from the Kentucky State Police Post at LaGrange responded to the scene. Detective Robert Noble would eventually take charge of the unusual case. The area was secured, and a crime scene analysis commenced. Investigators quickly determined that the body was that of a Caucasian female who had likely been dead for several days. Tall grass in the area had hidden the remains from the view of drivers along Route 330. The remains were found in a state of almost complete undress. Curiously, the only articles of clothing present were a pair of men's brown or black nylon dress socks pulled neatly onto the woman's feet. Decomposition had largely eradicated most of the facial features. The woman's left arm was missing, probably a result of animal activity. Authorities were, however, able to obtain several fingerprints from the victim's right hand, which remained largely intact. No natural teeth were present, so identification via dental records was quickly ruled out. Further examination indicated that the unknown female was approximately 25 to 40 years of age and that death had occurred as the result of strangulation. There were also indications that a sexual assault had occurred. The only unique clue to her identity was a crudely inked tattoo of the name Steve found on her right shoulder. Police fanned out, beginning an intensive search of the area for clues to the woman's identity. Less than a mile away, at the intersection of Routes 330 and 607, they found several articles of clothing they feel had belonged to the Jane Doe. Found at the intersection were a brown nylon blouse, 
a white pair of men's winter circle tennis shoes, size five and a half, a pair of faded blue jeans, and a blue bra. Authorities began their investigation. However, nine days later, a major bus accident in Carrollton, Kentucky, which claimed the lives of 27 people, temporarily sidetracked many of the detectives. The Jane Doe's case was placed on the back burner. By the time it was brought back to the forefront, it had already begun to freeze over. News coverage of the initial investigation did produce a number of leads which seemed promising. One lead in particular led police to this now abandoned eatery known as the Freeway Diner. The diner is located just over a mile to the east of where the Jane Doe's body was found, off exit 144 of Interstate 75 in neighboring Grant County. Witnesses told law enforcement that a woman resembling the Jane Doe had been seen at the diner several days before her body was found. The diner was patronized by many local residents, and a new face was likely to stand out. Although the immediate area around the diner was lightly populated, its location along the interstate highway, roughly halfway between Lexington and Cincinnati, meant that new faces were not an uncommon occurrence. Authorities investigated the eyewitness accounts, but the leads failed to pan out. Because her features had been all but obliterated, authorities turned to the science of facial reconstruction and commissioned a three-dimensional model to show what the Jane Doe may have looked like. On October 12, 1988, forensic anthropologists David Wolf and Virginia Smith unveiled this likeness of the Owen County Jane Doe. The shape of her face, skin color, hair color, and length were based upon established scientific methodology. Only the eyes and eye color were educated guesswork. No one recognized the woman, leading authorities to conclude that she was not a local resident. No local residents had been reported as missing. The unidentified woman was found here, along a grassy slope just off of Kentucky Route 330, at a location where its track turns to the northwest. The opposite side of Route 330 drops off steeply, and there is very little room for a vehicle to pull over or park. After the initial leads went nowhere, the case of the Owen County Jane Doe went cold. In June of 2007, she was one of the first unidentified females to be entered into the newly created NamUs system. Eight years later, in November of 2018, her case was profiled by ABC affiliate WHAS in Lexington. Their five-and-a-half-minute profile sparked a number of fresh leads and also brought the Kentucky State Police into contact with Parabon Nano Labs, a Washington, D.C.-based company which specializes in DNA testing for law enforcement agencies. The 2018 feature on WHAS revealed that the Owen County Jane Doe had been buried in an unmarked grave in Owenton and that her exact burial location had also been lost to time. It was also revealed that one of those present at the crime scene in 1988 had collected and preserved strands of the Jane Doe's hair. At the time, DNA analysis was in its infancy so this action can only be described as prophetic. The Kentucky State Police joined forces with Parabon, and a sample of the Jane Doe's DNA was extracted from the hair samples collected in 1988. As of this posting, the Othram Corporation is working to establish the Jane Doe's identity through genome sequencing. Articles from the first half of 2022 indicate that confidence is currently high for a positive outcome. Two cases, 140 years and over 60 miles apart. 
each unique in virtually every way, though bound together by their frustrating lack of a resolution. Perhaps scientific advancements, which were once relegated to the realms of fantasy and excessive aspirations, will someday return to the Harrodsburg and Owen County Jane Doe's that one thing which some all too often take for granted, their names. The Harrodsburg Jane Doe is said to have come to the Harrodsburg Spring sometime in the 1840s, perhaps registering under the name of Virginia Stafford. She is usually reported to have been in her early 20s and may have been accompanied by an unidentified male and several servants. Some later stated that the woman hailed from one of the so-called cotton states of the Deep South or possibly New Orleans. It was later speculated that she may have been either Molly Black Sewell or Minnie Reeser, both of whom originally hailed from Mississippi. If the legend is accurate, then the Harrodsburg Jane Doe was laid to rest on what would have been the southwestern corner of the old Harrodsburg Springs property. Her gravestone may at one time have been inscribed in some way, although by 1914 any words, letters, or numbers had been eroded. It is felt that the best hope for returning a true identity to the Harrodsburg Jane Doe lie within the ever-evolving science of DNA. Many historians, however, also feel that the answers may be locked away somewhere in an old family Bible, diary, or newspaper article. They are of the opinion that the continuing digitization of newspapers, books, and official documents will ultimately provide the key which will unlock her true identity. The Owen County Jane Doe was found along the southern side of Kentucky Route 330 on the morning of Friday, May 6, 1988. Authorities determined that she had lain where she was found for several days prior to her discovery. When she was found, her left arm was missing below the elbow and her facial features had been disfigured by decomposition and animal activity. The only clothing on her body was a pair of brown or black men's nylon socks with green fabric at the toes. Her death was caused by strangulation. Less than a mile away at the intersection of Kentucky Routes 330 and 607, authorities found several articles of clothing they feel belonged to the Jane Doe. These included a brown nylon blouse, a white pair of men's winter circle tennis shoes, size five and a half, a pair of faded blue jeans, and a blue bra. The Jane Doe was estimated to have been between 25 and 40 years of age. She was between five feet and five feet seven inches tall and weighed approximately 120 pounds. She had dark brown or black hair with some graying, which she wore in a short bob-style cut. It was determined that she had healed fractures around her left eye, right jaw, and L2 rib, which had healed within two years of her death. Police feel these injuries were characteristic of an assault and may account for the woman's lack of natural teeth. A skeletal examination revealed that she had given birth to at least one child in her lifetime. A tattoo of the name Steve had been crudely inked on her right shoulder. Authorities feel that the unidentified woman may have had ties to the Columbus, Ohio and Miami, Florida areas. If you have any information concerning the identity or murder of the Owen County Jane Doe, please contact Detective Paul Johnson with the Kentucky State Police at 859-428-1212. If you have any information concerning the identity of the Harrodsburg Jane Doe, please contact Todd Matthews with the Doe Network at the email address listed on the screen.
Thank you.